Cool.fm is the perfect station for music lovers who enjoy a mix of adult pop, modern country, and classic hits. Our unique blend of different genres creates an awesome listening experience that you won't find anywhere else. With Cool.fm, you don't have to constantly change stations to hear the music you love. Just download the Live 365 app and start listening to our curated selection of modern adult and country hits as well as the classics you know and love. So tune in to cool.fm and start enjoying the best of all your favorite music in one place. Hi, I'm Krista Grant. I'm writer and creator of Redemption, which is part of the Worthy Chaos series. And I'm here to promote our issue four coming out on Kickstarter. Uh, you can find us on Twitter under Worthy Chaos. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today on a wonderful day with a very talented and amazing comic creator. She's, of course, the creator of an amazing series called Redemption with a current Kickstarter campaign on the go. We're joined by the ever-talented Carissa Grant. How are you doing today? Hi. I'm good. Thanks for having me on. Oh, you're welcome. You know, I looked at the campaign. The video was amazing. Everything looked really incredible here, but I'm getting ahead of myself. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. My name is Krista Grant. I wrote 10 novels with a co-writer for fun while we were role-playing online. We thought the story was too good to waste, so we decided to take the first five novels and turn it into a comic book series uh, one, which is pretty much Buffy the Vampire Slayer meets Supernatural and Silent Hill with Resident Evil and anything horror-related we could throw in there. <laughs> It feels like a supernatural slash horror or horror genre mix, yeah. actually. It, it is is a very much supernatural. It's supernatural adventure because it's like a survival horror comic. And I've been told it's also a little bit of Romeo and Juliet in hell. So if you want to go that route, you can. Okay. It's a love story, but it's not like a mushy love story. So we don't want to like advertise it because, I mean, they're just two badass characters that like, you know, try to destroy everything else. So. That's awesome. I, I love seeing that. So what's the most misunderstood aspect about your supernatural horror genre that maybe people who don't follow it misunderstand? I guess people think that it's just like gore with like no major story behind it. It's not just a survival horror. It's got a very complex background. We created this whole world of these characters and they have, you know, amazing personalities. And because it was written by two different people, I wrote Serafina, I wrote all her, and my co-writer wrote all of Draven. So there actually are two complete personalities for these characters, and that makes it a little bit more unique. Also that it's all written. Series one is all completely written. There's a spin-off, that's the other five novels. There's a series two we started, but this is, you know, series one of these characters. And it's gonna wind up being 35 issues or so. Wow. So, yeah, the hard part is I'm converting it from novels to comic book scripts, and I'm on book three of the five, and I just started book three today, and I was separating it into make sure all our endings are cliffhangers to torture our poor fans. <laughs> book one is seven, book two is seven, and book three, which is, I hate to say it, is my favorite. I'm not allowed to pick favorite. It is my favorite. It is Resident Evil 2. In a nutshell, it's based on that world, and they're trapped in an infested city with zombies and all the lab creatures that were actually made from their blood, because she's an angel descendant and he's a demon descendant. They don't know that, but it was created from their blood. It's actually 10 issues. I separated the book out today, and I'm like, 10 issues? Okay, <laughs> didn't see that coming, but it was our longest one. It was 103,000 words. Yeah, we kind of got a little bit carried away. In my defense, I book three was my main idea for like 17 years before I got to finally write it. The other books kind of just work themselves around it and it just kind of worked out the way. We didn't write these in order. They are in order, but we kind of skipped around to like our favorite scenes. Like we'd want to do something and be like, oh, we, let's, we come up with this idea and be like, we have to write this now. And so we would jump around and write it. My co-writer, Jessica, who's an amazing writer, she is just as bad as me where I'm just like, I had this dream and they're doing this and she's like, well, now we have to do it. And then we would go off and, and do it. And, it and it worked out really good, but we're, we're incredibly obsessed with the story. <laughs> if we were rich, we would just release this for everyone to read. But 
unfortunately we're not we just want to see it created resident evil 2 is the game that got me to start writing <laughs> i role played as claire redfield mm. for 15 years before i i started writing this with my co-writer it took us to only two years to write 11 novels we're still writing it we're still just as obsessed and it gets worse because now we get pages so we're like oh look at the pages our artist is fast jonas de costa this is his first job oh, wow. so he liked the art this is his first paid job and i was so lucky to find him and he's a part of the team now mm. you know he went away for a month my husband said don't bother him let him have his vacation and i was like okay i didn't i didn't message him once and then two weeks in he's like i miss i miss drawing the story <laughs> he's like i can't wait to get home to write it and i was like yeah we can't wait for pictures we're having withdrawal he got back a couple of weeks ago and he's finishing up uh, the coloring on uh, issue four wow yeah I love collaborative efforts between not only writers, but also you have an artist. Looking at yourself and your, your co-writer, Jessica, building these characters in this world and the story, what do you bring to Jessica's style of writing in terms of collaboration? What does she bring from her style to your collaboration in writing? I started the story because it was my story that I had, but it was like a basic storyline of Resident Evil 2. I mean, I was a role player and... And I had this character and she was an angel and, and all this stuff. She took the role of Draven on. When I write, I would write a chapter. She writes her reaction, Draven's reaction to that, you know, what's going on. And then continues it a little bit. And then I do the next chapter and then she writes that. So she brings on Draven's immense personality and his absolute love for Serafina. Like, it's written so well. I'm more a storyteller than a writer because uh, I'm dyslexic and it was very hard for me to write originally. It took probably four years of role playing before I can even write, you know, a long reply. I started as a one liner. She writes like an author, like she can release this. Me, no. I, you know, that whole show don't tell. Yep. I, I have, not, I have none of that. <laughs> I tell the story. And then I tell what's going on and what she's feeling and whatever. Fortunately, she loves that. So it worked out great. And it's way easy to convert. It was meant to be a comic in my eyes because since I write what's happening, I literally just have to, you know, put in order of the scripts and separate it into panels. And that's pretty much it. And we have been praised by our dialogue because they're, you know, people have said, oh, it's not just comic book drivel. And it's because we wrote it as a novel first. So they have these strong personalities. I think that was the hardest part of converting it is cutting down the dialogue. And my first, my first script, my letter is like, did you want to see any of the art? <laughs> or, and I was like, oh, right. So I actually, my first script I wrote wound up being one and two because I had to literally cut it in half so that there was room to put everything. So that was that was a, a learning curve. I just jumped into this with like no knowledge of anything six months ago. I was like, oh, let's make a comic. Okay. That's how I jumped into that. Finding an artist that fits your vision <laughs> of this series is always an amazing feat to have as well too. And you mentioned Jonas DeCoste as well. When you gave your scripts to Jonas. What was the first piece of artwork that you got back that just was way better than what you had written on the page? It took 35, at least 35 artists to find him. Oh, wow. I could not find it. I've spent thousands of dollars trying to find an artist. He sent me a free page because I was so exhausted at that point. I had like five people doing a free page because I posted the story like on Reddit or Facebook. And then he comes in and he's like, can I add in? I was like, you can do a free page if you want. I'll look at it now. If I don't choose these five, I'll pay you for a page and you can send one, whatever. So he sends one and it's amazing. So literally the first page he sends was what we pictured our characters in our head. So like I had given a page from the script and I was like, here, do that. And it was so perfect. It was just gorgeous. And I was like, all right, I just told everyone else to stop. <laughs> and I was like, all right, let's do this right away. He was just perfect. So he actually started on issue two. I had someone for issue one. I literally threw away $5,000 to have him replace it wow. because the artist stole like three grand for me. And then I tried to fix it for two grand and it, it was fine. People actually liked it. And everyone told me, you don't have to redo it. I, I had to redo it. Like, they're my characters and we needed them to look the way we wanted to. And it's the first one. So it's what people see to bring them in. Mm -hmm. So I wanted it to be the best that it could be. He actually wound up redoing the entire thing. Issue two is his first book, then issue three, and then issue one. And you can tell by issue three that he has the characters down pat. He even said it as soon as he started issue three, he's like, I just know who these characters are now. I know their personalities. And now he's just 
part of the team. Like so obsessed as we are, the, the story is so addicting and not to sound modest about it. It is for us anyway. We're incredibly addicted to the story, but hopefully it will be for other people too. So it's never boring. I can tell you that much. It's so chaotic. The first two issues are the most chaotic. I mean, they're in a town merging with hell. <laughs> I mean, they're getting attacked by hellhounds and ghosts and zombies. Issue two is they're getting attacked by Anubis, the god of the underworld, and humans were the worst ones attacking them. The name Worthy Chaos fits perfectly. The reason why it's named that is because we named it after the story. He always says she's worth it because her angelic blood attracts every evil thing on the planet. She always feels bad that he's stuck protecting her, helping her, getting hurt because of her. And he just keeps saying it's she's worth it. So we figured she's chaotic and it's worth it. So it's worthy chaos. Kickstarter campaigns are usually a second or third or fourth job, depending on how many jobs you have here. So it's definitely a, it can be a struggle, but it also can be a joy seeing your hard work, you know, finally reaching the masses as, as I'm sure this series will talk about this campaign and what you're expecting from it besides getting funded. What is your end goal for the campaign? Obviously, we need money, but mm -hmm. the main goal is the amount of backers. We would like to reach more people. So even if people just backed the $5 PDF, I mean, we're perfectly happy with just having readers come in and read our story. We have a lot of faith in our story. We feel like if we just get people to read it, that they would just get as addicted as we are to it. And that's what's the most important to us. Our PDFs are $5 and you get both a black and white version and a color version for a catch up for, I think it's $10 or yeah, I think it's $15 for all four issues in both black and white and in color. So you get pretty much eight PDFs of the story to see them. Readers are more important to us, you know, and, and we were lucky our last campaign had, I went crazy and did all one through three by accident. My artist was so fast and by the time I got everything organized, it was, we had two and three and then, well, you might as well do one. So we had to do one. And so we released one and three all in one campaign. So we had 77 backers, which was really good for our first major campaign. So we were, we we're happy about that. We're really hoping to bring in at least that much and, you know, hopefully reach about a hundred would be a nice goal. And we're not really looking for profit. We all have jobs. We just really want to be able to make them. So if we can get enough people just to pay our artists, <laughs> bring in all our issues and hopefully someday bring in the spinoff, which would be great, which is the same characters, but told in a different point of view in a way. The spin-off is the beginning of the story is them separated for 10 years thinking each other's dead and then they wind up meeting in, in the hell town but in the spin-off they never leave. They're teenagers on the run. In this series she was trained as a supernatural hunter for those 10 years and he was trained as an assassin for 10 years. So they have some skills you know going into this. However in the spin-off they're teenagers with no supernatural skills no assassin skills and no idea about the real world. And they're still getting chased by every evil thing on the planet, in including demons and angels, which are not as innocent as everyone thinks. Both stories we just really want to tell, but we'll focus on this one. <laughs> we can get this one out. We'll be happy. You're just setting yourself up for more campaigns down the road. Yeah. That's all, you know, it just yeah. balances out, right? You know? Yeah. Yeah. You can't so. stop creativity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're mostly hoping just to cover our artist costs. I already paid for everything. Granted, it's putting us a little bit in debt, but I still have the house, so that's all that matters. As long as we could pay our artists, and probably if we brought in profit, we'd just pay him more. He's severely underpaid. I mean, he picked this price, but that's because he doesn't know his skill whatsoever. So we're hoping to eventually be able to pay him more because he's just so amazing. He gives us like two to three pages a day, wow. <laughs> Monday through Friday, and we just soak it up. <laughs> we're like, oh, new pages. Like everything in the world stops, pull over on the side of the road to check out the new pages. So that's just how obsessed we are with that. The campaign itself, obviously you have a wonderful batch of tears. You have so much content, especially when it comes to the comics itself as well. I'm sure you're selling the book too, but I'll let you talk about some of the tiers. Tell us what we're looking at acquiring once we support the campaign. We are our merch obsessed people. We have everything from plushies. This is Anubis. I think we have our zombie merman will be a plushie. Nice. Our skeleton bird is a plushie. We also have, I don't know if I'm putting this big one up, but we have different versions of the Anubis pillow. This is a three foot one. So he is huge. We have uh, statues, which I don't have down here because I would probably break them. 3D printed Anubis golden statues. But we have stickers, keychains, prints, hats, I mean, t-shirts, hoodies. <laughs> we have 
three different covers. We have the original from Jonas DeCosta, which is awesome. It's actually a Supernatural homage. If you could see the car in the background, that would be the car from Supernatural. One of the covers is a bar fight that Fabio did for us, which is amazing. He's done a couple of covers for us. Our third cover is uh, from DC artist Ken Hunt, who worked on Batman, Harley Quinn, all the DCs in like two decades of time. He did an amazing cover with Anubis as a zombie. It was colored by current colorist for internal pages for Lady Death Universe, CC De La Cruz, and she just knocked it out of the park. Yeah, two great variants. I don't usually do variants, but I got addicted to them. You can catch up in this tier. All of our issues or variants can also be in an add-on. You can add them on. Our last variant for issue two was by Ian Chase Nichols, who worked on The Tick and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Red Sonia. He did an amazing cover too with the new. Everyone loves Anubis, so there's always going to be a cover with Anubis, probably. <laughs> <laughs> The most popular seems to be the Anubis plushie. Our hand done, by the way. Someone handmade them for us. He comes with his own 3D printed staff. A side note of our uh, of our issues that I failed to mention before, each one has an Easter egg. Since there's five books, each book is going to have a contest that whoever finds all the Easter eggs in each book will get a prize that we give away free, like a free keychain or an Anubis statue or something. And all of the Easter eggs are from horror games or movies or urban legends, which which everyone seems to like. We just love to stick things in there. <laughs> Little secrets in the background. And stuff. We actually had a song, like a theme song, Ooh. and it was uh, written, performed, and produced just based on our two characters. So all the lyrics are based on them, Heaven and Hell, Angel and Demons. And you can get it as an add-on. It's $5. It's a download. And everyone can get it. Even if you buy PDFs, you can get it because it's just a download. And it's a really, really great song. And the lyrics are really good. It's got a very great beat to it, which is, we listen to it nonstop. Yeah, it was something a little different. One of those out of the norm thing is like, why don't I have a song? All right. <laughs> like, and then the first draft for the lyrics were like, oh yeah, that's, that's dead on. Uh, I'll probably get it remixed in the future. It's, it's a really good song. Well, I think people really like it. So it's called, it's a new band. It's called uh, Permissible Indulgence. They're on Spotify, YouTube, Twitter, and they are absolutely amazing. There's Lucas. They're just really, really good. And they're out there. You know, it's like they do different types of music, but they do it all themselves. It's hard to get music out there. So finding them was a luck. <laughs> Definitely check them out because it's just so unique to hear the sounds that they use a synthesizer and drums and guitar and they do it all electronically. Like they're not actually in the same room together when they record it. And it's just so cool to see and hear how they put it all together. And they make little videos, like cartoon videos, which I love watching. And the easiest way to find the Kickstarter, I mean, the link is great too, but all you have to do is search on Kickstarter for Worthy Chaos, and we are the only thing that comes up. So you can easily find us there. Yeah. Maybe you'll need a, uh, a redemption music video to go along with the song. Yeah, we're going to have to do that. Like if someone asked me my, if my dream would be like a movie or a show, I personally would love an r-rated animated show nice. like i would just adore it because just to see the characters the way i want to i mean you could find actors that you know are based we we had characters in mind you know when we role played we did have actors in mind but to see our characters actually animated and plus since our series is longer you don't want them the age or to quit or you know anything like that so that that would be my dream if i could have a choice it would be a an animated rated r because you know they curse a lot don't read our story if you don't want cursing my mom's nice review for it, which she doesn't read horror at all or anything. She's super supportive, but she does not read horror. And her review was, oh, I finally read your comic. Besides all the F words, it was a really good story. <laughs> Thanks, mom. <laughs> next, next campaign, do a t-shirt saying, my mom read my horror comic book. This is what she said. And all I got was this t-shirt. Yeah, I like that. I also was thinking I could put it on like when I do my novel, when I do the graphic novel to put Back it on the cover. back. Yeah. yeah, you know, the back cover with the reviews, I'm going to have my mom saying, besides the swear word, besides the F word, it's a really good story. Yeah. Um, someone did do a review for me yesterday. Oh. Um, I had sent this story to a bunch of people on Twitter. So I sent it to like 40 people like, oh, if you want to read issue one, here it is. Someone's like, oh, can I do a review? I was like, uh oh. I was like, yeah. <laughs> but he loved it. We said it was really good. Actually on our Twitter, if you go on our Twitter, which is uh, at worthy underscore chaos or search worthy chaos. And he liked the story a lot. He liked the characters. He said they were very likable. Um, 
he said he loved, which of course I had a sense of my artist. He said he loved the art and the colors and and, the, and everything like that. And uh, I, I've taken it to our local comic book store covers it. Uh, my Guy Comics, which is here in Tennessee. They actually said that their art was great for mainstream, you know, because when we first showed it to them, they're like, this isn't indie art. This is mainstream art, which was a huge compliment, which of course I had to instantly tell my artist. You know, seeing as you're starting your journey as a writer and a creative person that you are, does writing the series energize you or does it drain you? Oh, you have no idea how much it energizes me. <laughs> I literally can sit down at my computer and I don't think ahead at all. I don't plan anything. I just write. And I literally sit down. I'll write between three and 6,000 words, and then I'm going to be hyper for the rest of the day. So I could write this story all day, every day. I do, it takes me about a, two days to do a script of 28 pages. And then afterwards, I feel like I need to do more. Like I just, I either think, read, write, or plan this story. So <laughs> our motto here is story is life. Eventually we want to get that tattooed on us with our logo which is an angelic weapon this is our our logo is the angelic weapon that holds the power of souls that is what seraphina was created from and why everyone seeks to kill her because if they get this from her they will be able to tip the scales of the war between heaven and hell but there's actually another reason that her father wants that probably no one will figure out for a while <laughs> he hints at it there's a hint everything's hinted so no one can yell at me because we hint to everything. So if you're not paying attention, it's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> and for issue four, we're actually introducing our vampires. There are subspecies of vampires and they are called clotters because their heart beats every six hours just enough to keep off rigor mortis. If they don't feed directly from a human, then they start to decompose like a zombie. They do have their souls. They're not like soulless creatures. They do have humanity to them. However, because the only way to survive is to feed off of humans eventually they just become a little bit more evil and more evil as they go because how else would you survive well, the tricky part is that they all have a hive mind the family so if one bites you and or tastes your blood anyone in the family can track you anywhere on earth like they could just yeah and if you kill one of them they will seek you out for revenge which of course is the plot of you know issue uh five and forward because she gets bit she kills one and a huge family of vampires that have to go. And Ian Chase Nichols is actually working on another cover for us for issue six. And he's doing a wraparound cover. He goes, can I do a swarm of vampires? Like, yes, you can. <laughs> he's going to have vampires coming from the back cover and the, on the front cover. And they're going to be swarming our characters. I can't wait to see that. <laughs> I can't wait to see it either. That sounds amazing. I, I, I just yeah. love it. That was um, his idea. <laughs> when someone has a creative thought like that, you you kind of have to go with it. That's just yeah, amazing. yeah, absolutely. Like we we I like to recycle. I don't want to say recycle. <laughs> rotate the artists that we use for covers because we find ones we love, and then you know we're very picky about our characters and how they look. So to find such great ones, like Ken Hunt, the one that worked on DC for decades, he's actually going to do a graphic novel cover, which I cannot wait to see. It's going to have both Raven, Serafina, their father. So it's going to have the angel, Remnall, and his father, Asmin. It's going to have Anubis on the cover. There's a lot going on. Our graphic novel is going to be 230 six pages i think oh jeez that's amazing yeah. i love yeah <laughs> yeah well book i just realized that book three is going to be like 300 and something because it's 10 issues so I, I haven't scripted it yet i only separated the plot line so i know how each one ends and make sure it tortures everybody with the ending we'll look forward to that one you're broaching on omnibus versions per volume here like this is crazy <laughs> like yeah, it doesn't help. Like, I, we love that our artist is so fast. My wallet doesn't like it as much as I do, <laughs> but we have Kickstarter every other month. This one's, uh, you know, April 18th, but the next one is June 20th. The one after that is August 13th, and then October 3rd, and it's going to end on Halloween because that's one year that we've been working on the comics, one year since we found our artist, and three years since I found my co-writer. We love Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> No, I couldn't tell whatsoever. Yeah, to yeah totally, no, totally I know. escaped me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Looking at your backgrounds there and, and the books and everything like yeah. that. Yeah. Aren't those that's, awesome? That's, that's awesome. our banner for the cons. I'm not a big Comic Con fan when I to sell these. I think horror cons are more our thing. We have three horror cons set up, and I I have never been to one, so I'm I'm super excited. Do you know who James O'Barr? The, he's the mm -hmm. graphic writer oh, yeah, for, for The, the Crow. Crow. 
Yeah. He's that's the first graphic novel I ever really read. Oh. And I actually had done sketches from it when I was like in eighth grade. He, it's the first thing I took out when I was starting these scripts, being like, all right, what am I getting myself into? And <laughs> so I, I can't wait. He's gonna be at the same con I'm gonna be at. So I'm gonna get his autograph and I'm I'm super excited. Everyone asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most BS piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your new journey? I would say to just be patient, which I am horrible at, but just be patient and be passionate. But I I didn't really have that. I didn't need that advice. (laughs) If you're passionate about a project, people will see that and want to be passionate with it too. Patience, you know, obviously people aren't going to read it and find you overnight. Take your time to get it out there. That I think is the most important thing is patient. The most bullshit advice I ever got was to not redo one because that was the best thing. (laughs) They tried to be nice. They were like, don't redo it. You'll waste your money and no one cares it's the artist and I was like yeah no we redid it and I'm glad we did at first I thought I had myself up for it I was like oh I'm so hyped up to see the new one I'm watching me hate it it was so phenomenal and so perfect it's definitely worth it what was an early experience where you learned that language had power (laughs) um I guess just the mood that people get in when they read it or when I read it I mean just reading a simple chapter you're either going to get extremely emotional about it, you're going to laugh about it, or you're going to cry. Like, it's just, I can read a chapter and get so into it that you get lost in the world. I, I've had people write me and say, okay, I just read one, now where's the rest? You know, like, I need more. I had someone say, I read this seven times, I need the next one. <laughs> and I was like, it's coming, I'm every other month. But I would just say, like, if I don't get to read my story or write my story, it completely changes my mood. Or if I don't get to talk to my co-writer, we talk 24-7. And I probably talk more to my co-writer if I can't talk to her. Her internet's down. Yesterday, her internet was down. So we were like having total drawls. We couldn't talk about the story. I was working on scripts, but I couldn't share it with her. And it was, it was awful. So the words on these pages have way more power than they should over me. <laughs> Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? James O'Barr, I would say, from The Crow graphic novel. I loved that graphic novel. I started reading it when I believe I was eighth grade. I don't know how you old you are in eighth grade. But I was 11. And I loved the dark undertones of it. I loved uh, the uniqueness. I loved the characters and their personality. And I would just read that book nonstop. And then the movie came out. Besides the unfortunate reality of it, the movie was one of my favorites. James Obar is definitely somebody that I look up to. And I'm hoping to meet him in June. Crossing fingers. From a professional standpoint, you have created with an amazing co-creator, co-writer, as well as an amazing artist. Not only a graphic novel, but prose novels as well, too. So, And you're going to comic conventions and horror conventions. And you're showcasing this to the masses. You have a campaign currently ongoing. And professionally, you're successful in many different areas. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Yeah, I definitely. On a smaller scale, but definitely. I mean, I had 77 backers in the first campaign, and I thought that was absolutely insane. Because you have to realize, those 77 people, maybe seven of them knew my story. And the rest went completely on faith. I mean, they put their money into a story they they pretty much knew nothing about except for what I bragged about. They came along for the journey and they put their money into it. And I could not be more happy with that. That made me, I can't even describe. And the compliments I got on the story follow me throughout the day. I, I still have people writing me saying, I love the story. I can't wait for more. And to me, that's the best feeling ever. So I would say, yeah, I would say I, I, I on a smaller scale, I, I am considered a professional I'm a creator here. (laughs) The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? My failure was my first issue. You know, I lost a ton of money on uh, over five grand. A lot of time wasted on that one. And it was so heartbreaking. And it was so tempting to just quit because be betrayed by the first artist. It made us want to quit. But the love for the story, it could not. We stopped and we just had to keep going. And it it took us months and months from May through October. So it was like six months or so just to find our artist. I would just have to say, don't let it stop you. Even if you lose money on it, if you you know lose time on it, the only thing that's going to really derail the project is if we quit. And we definitely do not want to quit. That would be perseverance is the the number one key, I guess. Or stubbornness. (laughs) I'm probably more stubborn than anything, yeah. 
I've been there before. I, I completely understand and, and feel you there. Yeah. <laughs> the younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired of creative in their own way, whether it's as an author, a com creator, writer, or something creative in some way, shape, or form, maybe you've inspired them on their current path. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? There's so many ways to inspire people. Just doing what you're passionate about is really the only way. It's not what makes you money. I do that for my day job. I run my own business and that funds this, but this is my passion. Do what you love. If it's drawing, draw. You know, if it's writing, write. If it's singing, sing. And you know what? Even if people tell you you're not that good or whatever, you're better than you think you are. And it's better to just keep going and fight it because think of all the times that people failed if they had quit. Dr. Seuss, he failed 21 times. He was rejected 21 times and he was literally on his way to throw the book away when he ran into a friend on the street that said, oh, I can help you. I now look at him. Everyone knows who Dr. Seuss is. So it's best just be patient and keep going and don't quit. Well, the last question is a fun one, and it is this. If your life was a comic book or a novel, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Oh, man. <laughs> I, what would it be called? It's probably Success from the Couch because I never leave my couch. <laughs> um, I either write there or read there or watch the videos I make there. So, yeah. And my soundtrack, I'm... I. That's a tricky one. I'm going to use my own song. My song is my soundtrack. <laughs> but if I was to use a mean one, I don't know. There's just, I'm going to say the theme song from Nightmare on Elm Street, because that was uh, my first horror movie I ever saw. It, 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 it inspires me if I need a soundtrack. <laughs> Street awesome. Warriors. That was the best. That was my first scene ever. Well, I do hate to say this, Carissa, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you for having me. It was really fun. I loved it. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where is the Kickstarter campaign? How long is it ongoing? And anything else you'd like to share? So the Kickstarter would be active now. So you can go straight on Kickstarter. It'll be live until I believe May 18th. Uh, not positive, but it's either the 16th or 18th. And you can find us on Kickstarter by searching Worthy Chaos. It's issue four, but it's also one through four. So you can get catch up if you aren't in there. You can support it in any way that you feel like you can. If you can't afford a $5 PDF, then just share it with your friends. Share a link. We're on Twitter under at Worthy underscore Chaos or just search Worthy Chaos. And if you can... Retweet our links and everything. We would absolutely love it because we just want to get our story out there. We have a story to tell and we need people to read it and enjoy it as much as we do. So you don't have to spend money to support us. We just want people that love our story. We'll follow along our characters with us. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. Website's going through a revamp, so you can find all of these amazing interviews on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash c forward slash tgtmedia. And of course, the podcast is back. You can find that at twogeekstalking.podbean.com or just search for Two Geeks Talking on any of your favorite audio streaming service. Do me a favor like and subscribe there because i'm bringing back the podcast as i say every week everyone has a story to tell it's up to me to help bring that out thanks for listening and watching on two geeks talking thank you